Oh, well, y'all must be ready for me. Okay. So, I want you to be ready. You ready? Good morning. Good morning. Awesome. A plus on that one. Great job. Okay. I want you to show your teeth off this morning. Find someone to smile at. Okay. All righty. Welcome, all of you. It's good to see you all, like every Sunday. It's always good to see you. Um, and it's especially nice to see some of you visitors. And if you are an unfamiliar face, welcome. And we would love for you to fill out the information sheet. We call it the, or I call it, the flappy sheet of paper because it flaps and it's in the back of your bulletin and it also rips out. So it can be folded up and put in the offering plate, the golden plate. It'll come your way in a minute. Alrighty, I have a lot of announcements that aren't in the bulletin. So, some of them are, but please, listen up. Um, this Thursday, we will be feeding the JSU Defense. Um, so, we would like for you to help out. If you would like to help out, please get a covered dish to the church, this church, the CMC, the gym area, at by 6.15 on Thursday, okay? What day? Thursday. What time? Ooh. Some of y'all don't even need bulletins, huh? Okay. Now, in your bulletin, you will see a deacon election form. Please fill this out today. We're going to tally up these. And then tonight, we're going to have the deacon ordination service. So... Your job to do this and come back tonight at 6 o'clock. Okay? Um, got that out of the way. Next Sunday night, we will um, play volleyball. So, please, I will have a um, sign-up sheet next week. If you would like to play volleyball, please sign up. It, it is always a ton of fun. But if you do not want to play volleyball, do not want to break a hip or anything, there will be a concert, a free concert, <laughs> at First Baptist Weaver, and everyone is invited. It's a group called This Hope. So uh, if you would like any more information on that, please see me. All right, I'm hurrying. Okay, this afternoon at 4 o'clock, we will have our church council meeting in here, 4 o'clock. So if you are a committee member um, or chairperson, please come and be a part of this meeting. Um, and then at 5 o'clock, I need to meet with my leadership council. You know who you are. Um, this Wednesday is the blood drive. Now, some of us have just too much blood and we need to give it away. It's very important. If you are able to donate blood, please be here at, on Wednesday from 2 o'clock to 7 o'clock. So you have plenty of time if you work. But they always try to get a number like 25, and we can do that. But it, the past few meetings, we haven't been able to meet that goal. So please help us come at 2 to 7 on Wednesday for blood drive. And also going on Wednesday is a meeting at 6 o'clock. If you are on the hospitality kitchen committee, you will meet at 6 o'clock. Um, now, I will hush and let Rhonda do some talking. So Rhonda, come on up here. Good morning. Our, um, as you all know, we've been announcing for the past couple of Sundays that October the 4th is kind of promotion Sunday, but it's we're calling it Celebrate Sunday School. And we have a couple of changes. Um, instead of having breakfast that morning, um, the congregation has been asked to help provide um, a meal for the Sunday school teachers, for, for everybody, but to honor our Sunday school teachers after church. And we're going to do breakfast instead, the donuts and the danishes and things like that. We're going to do that the first Sunday in November. But our Celebrate um, Sunday School will still be October 4th, and we'll have a covered dish lunch after service on that Sunday to um, honor our Sunday school teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Rhonda. All righty. One last announcement. I'm sorry. One more. All right. Last week, last Sunday, we met about Bethlehem, the reenactment that's coming up in December. I mean, a lot were not able to come to that meeting. But I have some sign-up sheets if you would like to be a part of it. You can be on the cleanup team, setup team, hospitality team, 
acting team or publicity team. So if you're interested in that, please see me and put your name on the list. And it's always fun. We can put you to work somehow. And um, we will meet next Sunday at 4, and you will meet in your little group that you signed up for. And we will get started and get this going. All right? So I've talked too much. So now it's time for you to do the talking. You're going to find someone and say good morning to them or I love you and hug them or whatever you want to do. So go for it. Our scripture call to worship this morning is from Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, verses 35 through 37. And he sat down and called the twelve and said unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. And he took a little child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said unto them, Whosoever shall receive one of such as little children as this, in my name receiveth me, and whosoever receiveth me receiveth not me, but him who sent me. Has not been broken. Who here among us out guilt or pain? So oft abandoned by our transgressions. If such a thing as grace exists, and grace was made for lives like this. There are no strangers
First time I heard that song, going down Quintar, and never it had a CD in. That thing came on with about a hundred voice choir. By the way, it wasn't much better than that. I just heard. I almost ran off the road. Awesome song. There are no strangers here this morning, people. There's no outcasts in the family of God. There are no orphans. Thank you, Lindy. If you're visiting or a total stranger to our church, Lynn, Lindy Curry, she was a. She used to be a green. I know old Keevan and her mama back there. Just the, Is your mama there? She's not with you. Okay. Well, case you account. The last time she was here, I introduced and I left out Ken, folks. I didn't do it on purpose. If you are any way related to Lindy, raise your hand. I just don't leave no. Holy cow. <laughs> Look at that. Half this church. Thank you so much. God bless, God bless you for singing that song today. Wow. I stand amazed in the presence of who? Jesus. Jesus. And now 512 and 513. 512 and but you stand with us, please. Man, y'all be ready to sing now. Let us sing. <laughs>
Blessed is anyone who perseveres under trial. Such one has stood the test and will receive the crown of life that has been promised to those who love the Lord. CBF endorsed Chaplain Will Kennard serves as associate, direct, associate Director of the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs National, National Chaplain Service. As an Associate Director, he is responsible for supporting over 600 chaplains in 152 VA medical facilities. VA chaplains care for veterans from pre-World War II to those who have recently returned from Afghanistan and Iraq. Common injuries with these, within these facilities include traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress disorder. Please pray not only for the strength and guidance for these chaplains who care for our nation's veterans, but also for hope and recovery for the injured, injured veterans and their family members. Would you join me for a moment of silent prayer for these chaplains and also for the veterans they serve? Amen. How's everybody doing? Okay, I'll ask you a question. How many of you watch television? Any? Oh, man. Oh, well. Okay, that's all right. I expected that. How many of you watch uh, cartoons? SpongeBob? Uh, Penguins of Madagascar? It's one of my favorites. Okay. How many of you watch sports? Anybody see sports? Did anybody stay up late for that Auburn game last night? I know people are going to be sleeping today, and I'll know who, who was out there watching that game. What about the news? Y'all watch the news? Uh, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, I probably wouldn't that way either. Um, when I watch the news, I like to watch the news. But when I watch the news these days, a lot of times what I see is bad news. It's bad news. In fact, uh, even the little commercial in between uh, plays of a football game I was watching was advertising. It was the Texas, Texas Tech game. And in between, they were advertising, getting us ready for the news that would come on later. And the guy said there was a prayer walk in Birmingham to pray against all the violence that's been happening in a neighborhood where there's been a lot of crime. And he said something about, we're going to be reporting about the prayer walk, but even as they prayed tonight, there was yet one more murder in Birmingham. And I told me, I said, why did he even add that? I don't want to hear that. That's not very good. You know what? Have you ever heard about reporters? You know what a reporter does? A reporter goes out and tries to track down the news and get the story, the full story, and then a reporter comes back and shares it with us, either writes it in a magazine or a newspaper or reports it on, on the uh, television or radio. So this is what I want you to do this week, okay? That's what I'll be talking about a little bit today. I want you to pretend like this week that you're a reporter, okay? And I want you to look for news, but this is what I want you to look for, okay? We're looking for good stories, good news stories, all right? Now, I know that when you go out there, you can find some bad news stories. There'll be people who get sick, people who get hurt, people do some bad things, all that stuff you'll hear. But I'm going to ask you to do something else because I believe that God is doing a lot of good stuff in our world. And sometimes, because of all the bad news that we hear, we forget about that. So would y'all be reporters? And this is what reporters do. I want you to look this week and see if you can find something good that's happening at your school, at home, at church, it could be anywhere. Find some good news, okay? And then what's a reporter got to do once they get their story? They got to tell their story. So I want you to do those two things. Be a reporter. Look for some good news this week. Will y'all do that? And then report it to somebody. You report it to your friends, to me, to somebody in Sunday school, at school, your parents, anybody, okay? So will y'all be good news reporters this week? I believe God is doing a lot of good things in our lives, and I bet every one of you, if we look, can be able to find it, okay? So y'all be good news reporters this week, all right? And I'd love to hear some of your stories next week, so y'all let me know, all right? Thank y'all.
The offertory hymn for the morning is 354. Leaning on the everlasting arms, 354. We sing all three stanzas. Join us, please, as we sing. Great hymn.
Today I'll be reading from the book of Proverbs in chapter 31. And before I do, I wanted to call two things to your attention, just to remind you that today is a day that we are electing deacons, five new deacons for our church. And a lot of you have already turned in your ballots, but if you haven't, we'll be counting those just right after uh, the morning worship. So if you would like to turn in your ballot and you haven't, you can bring it up here right after church or take it to the church office uh, when we finish. And then we will have our ordination service because some of the nominees that we have will need to be ordained if they're elected. We'll have an ordination service tonight at 6 o'clock. Uh, that's something that's, uh, I think, very important and special and sacred. I hope that all of you will come and participate in that service. look forward to that very much. Uh, you'll also note a little place in the bulletin uh, where I have challenged us to give an offering, a special offering for world hunger, and I hope that you will participate in that. It's through the month of September. We'll end it on October 4th. Uh, it's already been announced, I think, a couple of times. Uh, I was doing some study for, in preparation for our missions, a study we do on Wednesday night, and uh, it really just struck my heart that we haven't done uh, near as much as we should do in that area, so I'd like to just designate a special offering for that and give as you feel led to do. Uh, I was looking over some statistics uh, about this recently from the United Nations uh, and it talked about the needs in the world and right now they estimate one billion people in the world are hungry every day. And yet, because I guess of the economy, we blame so much on that, the aid given to combat world hunger and poverty issues is at a 20 year low. So I hope that you will give, not motivated necessarily by these statistics, but motivated by your own devotion to Christ and His care and concern for the poor around Him. Let's listen now to the words from the book of Proverbs in chapter 31. Begin in verse 10. A capable wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from far away. She rises while it is still night and provides food for her household and tasks for her servant girls. She considers a field and buys it with the fruit of her hands. She plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She's not afraid for her household when it snows, for all her household are clothed in crimson. She makes herself coverings. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the city gates, taking his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She supplies the merchant with sashes. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband too, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her a share in the fruit of her hands, and let her works praise her in the city gates." This is God's word for us this morning.
I want to begin today telling you something about me that you probably, I hopefully, already know, something that's deep inside of me. At heart, I am an optimist. I'm very optimistic about life and the future, the world we live in, the church, and my country. I'm very optimistic about things. And you need to know that about me. Now, it's not that I've never suffered or ever had bad things happen to me. I have. Uh, things have been uh, terrible, uh, deceitful, sinful, uh, things that have caused me to have long periods of uh, depressive type uh, feelings. So I've had those things happen to me and to the people that I love and care about. To me, an optimist does not deny those things. An optimist doesn't deny the way things are in the world. Uh, an optimist doesn't really wear rose-colored glasses and, and looks at stuff as if they're under delusion and pretend sticking their head in the sand like an ostrich or something like that. An, opt an optimist uh, looks at the world and sees the real world and yet also sees the good that's in the world, the good that's in the world that God created the good that God continues to create in the world. To me, an optimist uh, tries to strain to look for the goodness that I believe still exists in every person and in every society and in every church. I like what Robert Kennedy said. Some people look at the things that are and ask why. I look at things and dream of things that are not and ask why not. And I like that. Now, one of the reasons I'm an optimist is I like history so much. I like going back and reading the stories of people's lives that came way before us. And in their stories, I have found a lot of reason to hope. A lot of times when people thought it was the last word, the end, it turned out to be only a temporary ending. An end for a season. In the stories of history, we find that folks who were uh, enemies have over time become often great allies together. I find stories of unspeakable tragedy, and yet out of the tragedy and out of the ashes has risen a stronger people. Uh, goodness has overcome evil. <laughs> Uh, and the best of people sometimes has happened in their hardest and most difficult times. And so I see that a lot in history. Some people have been broken. And then later, they find that they are strong in those broken places. I've also found reason to be optimistic by studying my own history. Uh, last Sunday night, uh, our worship service was in part asking us to trace uh, our own personal history, our own spiritual autobiography. Uh, I had things above the line and things below the line. Uh, the economy was good for me, the economy's been bad for me, and the economy not just money, the economy of my soul. It's been up and down, but overall I see great reasons to hope. I see wonderful, beautiful faces in my story of goodness and of kindness and of strength and courage. And so I hope that rubs off in my preaching. I want to be a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That means that when I stand before you to open the sacred words of Holy Scripture, I want to try to proclaim them through the lens of the good news of God for all of us. I like to proclaim the old, old story of Jesus and His love. And you know, sitting with Jesus always makes me feel more optimistic. I'm mindful of a graduation speech that Ted Koppel once gave to a university in our country, and I read it several years ago, uh, preparing for a baccalaureate at Pleasant Valley. And I was looking, you know, what are people saying? And I saw his, and his was about a desire, he said, for people who were graduating from college to be optimistic. And this was in the late 1990s. Uh, he reminded us in a real way that being optimistic can sometimes uh, bite you. You can get hurt by it. You can get fooled, be taken advantage of. Uh, one of the stories he told was about the optimists who 
stayed in Germany before World War II began, hoping to make their country better and to change the course of militarism and uh, anti-Semitism and so forth that they had charted. And so he talked about the optimists who stayed in Germany, and many of those didn't survive the war, as you know. And yet, in his speech, he was still encouraging these bright-eyed young American and international students who were about to graduate from a fine university to go out into the world and be optimists. And I want to do the same for you today. And I would like for us to look at this beautiful last chapter of a book of wisdom called Proverbs. It's full of sayings about things pertinent to everyday life, and it ends with a story about a woman. I think it ends with a story about a lot of women. In fact, when I put the title, An Ideal Wife, I had a few comments about that. Uh, somebody approached me right before church and said, we're going to be listening very carefully you know, to what you say today about an ideal wife. I told Mary last night, I said, this is the title for the sermon, An Ideal Wife, and she just rolled her eyes. <laughs> and I've got one. I've got one. I, I think if we listen carefully to what I read in the last part of Proverbs 31, uh, in my mind, that's not one woman. Uh, any one person who tried to be everything and do all those things would... Uh, I think literally exhausted themselves to death. I don't think that's what this is talking about. Instead, I believe that this is a, a composite picture. Now, uh, you may think that I'm trying to get off the hook here, but I truly believe that. I think it's a composite picture, and it is one of the beautiful lessons of Scripture that I hope that we will uh, put on our good news reporting eyes and see how God brings to the surface the good things that are happening that oftentimes is below the surface, not recognized. Here we find in this story a composite picture of the great contributions of women in ancient society and of the many different roles that they play. Now, we often read this passage only at funerals, along with Psalm 23. We read this, and I've read it at funerals for women who are of extraordinary character and ability and were extraordinarily loved by their families. Uh, they have uh, risen to call her blessed, and so we read it at funerals to honor people like that. Uh, but it's not a, a passage for, dead, for the dead. It's a passage for the living, and I want us to hear it that way. Now, when we read through this passage, uh, if this is what the Bible is honoring about the roles of women, then we're going to have to step back and say, since the Bible was written such a long time ago, that this is traditional, biblically accepted roles for women in society. And I think everybody would agree with that. What happens a lot of times is people just sort of look at part of the story and they overlook some other parts of the story. Now, part of the story affirms what we often in our minds think of traditional roles for women. Uh, there are domestic duties in here. And they should be praised. Cooking, taking care of the household, making sure your children are warm and fed and patted and cared for on the way to school. Caring for your husband and loving your husband with really all that you have. Traditional roles that are good and wholesome and wonderful. And they're in this passage, and I like that. My grandmother was like that. She, uh, she stayed at home and worked raising four kids as my grandpa fought in World War II, sold insurance, went all over the country, traveling, and she took care of a lot of those home duties, kept the home fires burning. Uh, she used to make some wonderful cornbread that I wish some of y'all try to make sometime. Little padded out patties. She'd put it in the frying pan. You'd just fry on the top of the stove. It was a white cornmeal. I'm, I'll give you the recipe if you really want to try it. <laughs> I'm serious about that. She once told me because she loved to take care of us and she wanted to do her own thing in the kitchen and you really couldn't get in there even if you wanted to help her out. She said, all I want is a thank you. I said, a good thank you will go a long way. So I hope that you'll thank the women who would do those kinds of things. But in this story, we also find other roles that oftentimes have been overlooked and sometimes uh, have been refused to people simply because of their gender. We find that this woman 
does charity work, opening her hands to the poor. She has a cottage business, keeping the lamp going late at night, working on whatever she's producing in her own little factory to sell. She is a business person who dresses for success. We are told she has the strength of arms. I imagine she was doing aerobic workouts way before that was popular. This is a woman that is able to go to the merchants and work out deals for profit to help in the merchant business society that she probably was a part of. And at the end, she uh, is able to carry out a real estate deal. Selah. <laughs> Isn't that something? It's sort of all in the Bible, and it's been there for a long time. And at the end of Proverbs, the Proverbs ends this way, Be sure that you grant the daughters of Israel a share in the prophets and in the goodness and in this land that God has given to all of God's people. You see, the Bible will not let us pigeonhole people and to tell them what kind of roles they should play in society simply because of the way God created them. God's goodness exists in all people. Some people ask me from time to time, how is it that women at Williams are allowed to preach or to be deacons, be ordained? Where do you find that in the Bible? And I sometimes want to tell them that I find it all over the pages of the Bible. It is everywhere if you would only look. Read it, listen, and see it. See, God has been bringing this stuff to the surface. This is what God does. Despite efforts to keep things down, to only focus on certain areas, to set things according to cultural attitudes, or to drive things because we want to spin the news a certain way, God is still working to do His good work, and it will be brought to the surface. Right there in the Bible, all over the Bible, are stories of women who support their husbands, who go out and do difficult and hard work in a terrible militaristic society of ancient times. Right alongside those women who are serving quietly in the tent, caring for their families, are stories of people like Esther, who does the mysterious work of God in the harem of a king who has very little morals and yet she is able to help save an entire nation of people by being obedient and courageous for God's sake. Alongside her is a prophet named Miriam who works with her brothers Aaron and Moses to proclaim the guidance and wisdom of God to an escaped people on the Exodus who are making their way brand new free people in the world. Beside her is a judge over the nation of Israel named Deborah before there were kings in the political structures that we would know about under David and Solomon. And right along beside her is a deacon who served in the New Testament named Phoebe that even Paul recognized for her great gifts to the church in Romans at the end of that book. And beside her is the greatest disciple of all according to the New Testament the very mother of Jesus, who is there not only to worship and ponder his life in her heart at the birth, who is there to try to be with him in his ministry, and it stays and sticks by him when all other disciples, almost all, leave him in his crucifixion at the cross. When we were in Atlanta last Monday, I was able to go to Atlanta and sit in on a class in McAfee with Dr. Allen. I haven't done that in a long time. And I loved it. He teaches church history, of course. And in the stories that he was telling that day in the lesson, it was about the early Christians who died for their faith. And he talked about two women, Perpetua and Felicitas, who were both killed because they simply would not recant or stop believing and professing that they believed that Jesus is the real Lord. They would worship no other emperor, god, or idol. One was pregnant and gave birth to a child. Her father came to the prison where she was being held and pleaded on the basis of family values for her to go back to her place 
in the home and to take care of her child. She responded by saying that by standing up for her faith, she was doing it for her child. In the arena, they set wild beasts on these two women. One was a bull who gored Perpetua. She almost died, but not quite, and so one of the new Roman soldiers came over to stab her and finish the job, and he was a little shaky, and he missed, only cut her some, and she shrieked in pain. And with a trembling sword, he went to go at her again, but was shaking so badly that she grabbed the end of the sword and put it to her neck and thrust it in. And the early Christians took that to mean, by the witness of these two women, that the power behind the faith that they had was even greater than the power of imperial Rome. It's an amazing story that sometimes we forget, but they are out there. What I simply want you to think about today being an optimist is that no matter how scary this world is and how anxious you may be about your own life, the economy, the politics of our time, the nations, the wars, the rumors of wars, the illnesses, all the stuff that's out there and the reasons to be worried and scared and upset. Despite all of those things, I am optimistic enough to believe that God is still good. God is still working. And I believe that God continues to work to bring to the surface the good things that are happening. We tend to look and see the train wreck, the horrible the grotesque, the crime, the hurt, and the pain. God looks and sees the good that's going on. And God, I believe, is still working to wring out good. I see it all over the pages of history. In my own story, in the stories of people all, of all times. Wringing good, shedding His grace, working for our salvation, and holding out hope to us. Now, some writer has said, and I think this is probably right, we live on the edge of a new time. Things have changed drastically more in one century than they had all the previous centuries combined. Change happens at a, uh, an incredibly fast pace now. He described it as if it was the beginning of creation when the continents collided. You remember the tectonic plates, Pangaea broke apart and then there was the collisions. And I imagine it really shook things up quite a bit. Being an optimist, I remember that the Smoky Mountains were created during the collision. And I'm happy for that. The seas drained from Alabama. And I'm happy for that. The world shakes for a lot of us. So I simply want to hold out some practices for you that might be helpful for you. When I was uh, early in seminary, I was reading and was told to read a book by a great preacher of the early 1900s who said a preacher should always have the newspaper in one hand and the Bible in the other as they prepared to preach. I think that's good advice. But I simply want to ask you to do this. For a season, for a while, would you put down the newspaper, turn off the television, and shut down your computer and just hold the Bible? Just hold the Bible for a while up close to your heart and spend some time in God's Word. I think you will find great reasons to be hopeful about your life if you'll do that. There is so much good news that God would share with you with His love letter called the Holy Bible. Let it intrude in your busy life. Let it intrude into your worries and into your anxieties. Shut off the television. Shut down the computer. Put down the newspaper. And just hold the Bible. And it's words that are living and meaningful and active, able to pierce to the very joining places of your soul and spirit. And let it speak to you. Somebody said that the best part of prayer and being with God like that is not the asking, it's just the kneeling, the kneeling place 
where you kneel to ask, where your soul rests in the presence of God. It's just being with God. You know, I don't think that we let God hold us enough. Settle down. Quit squirming. Shut some stuff off. And just let the Word and the presence of God embrace you. You know, God does shout. But He also speaks in a still, small voice. It's going to be hard to hear it if you're just always too busy, always too focused on the negative, always worried, and always harassed. Study the Bible. My study of the Bible has conditioned me to be an optimist. Studying the Bible has made me think that God will have the last word. Studying the Bible has made me come to expect the unexpected. When I think things have been settled and fixed, God seems to upset the apple cart and do the unexpected and amazing, amazing, graceful thing that God can do. It's taught me that life will go on even when something happens that's scary and hurtful to me. Life will go on. And it's taught me that life is going where God wants it to go. You know, there's a lot of people that come up to me and they say, things are getting so bad, surely the end of time must be here, as if God's just going to let everything get to the place where it all is ready to go to the handbasket and then swoop in like Superman and save the day. That's not the God I read about in the Bible. This is a God who's with us in the very ideas of our creation, the God who's with us when we're shouting from the mountaintop, but also the God who accompanies us into the valley of the shadow of death. There's never a day, never a moment, never a time when the goodness of God does not exist for you. When the presence of God with those great arms that can hold us with strength that we cannot imagine is available to us. You know, some people look at the events of the world and their lives and they think about the big things, the macro events. I like to look at the micro events because I think there's a lot more of those and if you add them all up, they amount to a lot more. So one thing I'd ask you to do is to be a reporter, like I told the kids. Look in your own story, in your own life, and be a reporter and see if you can't find the good that I believe God is doing in this world. I have a little journal that I fill out most every day, and it asks me questions, things that I can leave behind for my children. This last week, one of the questions was, what great quotes have people said or poems or sayings that have meant a lot to you and affected your life. And as I thought about those, the great quotes I have have come from people that do not have their names written in any history book at all. They're not famous. They're not well known, except to me. They're ordinary folks who loved me. They took the time to be with me. They were real, and they really cared. They were just close. Now, I want you to reclaim hope. Hope in God. Hope that God is still good. Hope that God still lives. Hope that God is still active. I see it all over the Bible. We are told not to grieve, as others do, who have no hope. Because we are believers in God. This woman in this story, a composite of women, is said to embrace the future. She will even laugh at what will come because her hope is so strong. Jesus told us over and over again not to fear and do not weep. Even in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, Blessed are you who do mourn or weep now, for you will laugh. He is so confident of the future of God, and I hope you will be too. So I hope you'll pray this prayer. Make this a practice. Lord, give me the eyes to see goodness and hope that you put before me in the small things every day. Lord, sustain my heart with the good that is. Lord, help me to add to the good by the way I live my life. Will you pray that prayer? I hope you will. I ask you to pray that prayer because I'm just optimistic enough to believe that God answers those kinds of prayers. You see, we are called 
all of us to proclaim the gospel, the good news, the old, old story of Jesus and his love. And because of that, I am awfully optimistic. Amen. I'd ask us to respond today to the message of worship where we've been a part of together, to the ways God has been touching your life and working in your life. I've given you one specific challenge, and that is to be people who will pray and look for the good that God would show you and to allow God to embrace you and love you. I hope that you'll do that. You may have other decisions you need to share with us today, to join our church, to make a recommitment, to your faith in Jesus, to come and pray down here, or to accept Christ as your Savior, the most important decision you could ever make. I invite you to come do that now as we stand and sing. Here today for worship. Let's uh, prepare now for our benediction. But Roy.